Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha and welcome today to Think Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. My guest today, Steve Lipscomb, ran recently for the lieutenant governor slot in the Hawaii Republican primary in 2018. And it's our pleasure today to be able to welcome him to the program and talk a little bit about what it's like to go from a private life to a public one, what it's like to run for office, and why anyone would do that. Uh, I want to introduce you to him now and welcome him to the program. Steve, aloha. Thanks a lot for having me on the show. Well, thanks for joining us here today. You know, My it's pleasure. always a delight to chat with you and just to learn a little bit about your perspectives. Now, tell me a little bit about your background. You were in the Air Force, weren't you? I was in the Air Force for just over 20 years, uh, originally teaching young men and women how to fly in, in a trainer jet. I always say it's the only oh, so you were a pilot. I was a pilot, and I always say it's the only airplane where the enemy's in the cockpit with you, so you got to be <laughs> on your toes all the time. So then after that, you were in the corporate world a bit. You worked for some pretty prestigious companies. I worked for two Fortune 500 companies. I worked at uh, yeah. Dell for three years and then Microsoft for six out here in the Pacific. My, uh, my sales patch was Japan, Korea, Alaska, Guam, and Hawaii. So in some sense, America has treated you well. You've benefited for, by being a United States citizen. You know, today our country gets so much criticism. What are your thoughts about the U.S.? I'm a big pro-U.S. sort of guy. I've been all over the world. I've lived all over the world. I've been in combat zones. I've been in peace areas. I've seen the best the world has to offer. I've seen the worst. I've seen uh, where civilizations where people are sort of afraid to be a policeman uh, or where the police officer force is corrupt. So America's a great place and I'm a big pro-American kind of guy. Now, does this mean you don't see any of the problems that we face today or the difficulties, the inequity? Or no, so definitely. Forth? I mean, of all the places I would live, I'd still live in America. And certainly there's always going to be challenges to overcome, but that's what, that's what we do. Well, now you live in Hawaii. Why do you make Hawaii your home? Well, it's a good story. So we had, uh, my wife and I had a three-year assignment out here in the early 90s, uh, well, actually 98 to 2001. And so when we retired in 2007, we were in Germany as our last assignment. And I said, hey, you followed me around for 20 years. You've sacrificed your career for mine. You raised our little boys to where they are now at eight and 11. Where do you want to live? Because the, the, <laughs> the military gives you a one-way ticket. And she said, Hawaii. I was like, well, we're not going to be able to afford that. <laughs> no one joins the military to get rich, and we're no exception. And I, her second choice was also Hawaii. So, uh, so we moved out here, and we knew it was going to be financially challenging. And, uh, but we were eager to make it work. We loved the environment. We loved the people. We loved that whole aloha spirit. In fact, I, I tell people the first three words I learned was, were aloha, ohana, and mahalo. And those sort of concepts don't percolate to the top of all communities. And uh, we, that's what we really found attractive here. Well, like a good number of people, you could be enjoying your Mai Tai down at the officer's <laughs> club or at Fort DeRussi now and right, living right. A, a life of a relaxing retirement. But you decided to throw your hat into the rink in the political arena. Uh, and you recently ran for lieutenant governor in the Republican Party. I did. Why did you do that? Well, I tell you. No, I, I don't mean to say, why did you do that with, <laughs> with incredulity? Right. But I, I just wanted to explore your mind and really understand your motivation. So there was, there was two drivers. One is, well, first of all, the, the motto here is no vote, no grumble. So the next level up from that is you can't complain about the system if you haven't tried to be part of the system to correct it. So the two, two glaring issues I saw was monopoly in government which is a real challenge for democracy. When you have only one party, uh, it breaks the whole republic democracy sort of model. And there's no room for robust debate on topics. Um, and there's no real watchdog function to make sure that we the people's money is being spent correctly. And I think we're seeing um, the result of that is increasing taxes all the time because there's no watchdog on the spending. Now, when you talk about monopoly in government, you could be talking about either party, depending upon who had the monopoly. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the Democratic that, Party that's right. here in Hawaii. And, and, yeah. and, and what I mean is that regardless of which party it is, if it's a monopoly, it's bad no there's no what. other opposition, it's, it's a problem. Well, so you remember playing the game Monopoly when we were kids, and the, whoever had the monopoly, it was only good for them. It was bad for everybody else. And I think that's true in government here. Again, no uh, opportunity for robust debate and really no watchdog function to point out the, the the bad parts of any sort of legislation. Well, there are lots of ways citizens can respond and bring a, a, an attempt to change the system. You could write op-eds. You could write le letters to the editor. You can 
a vote for good candidates and so forth, but you decided to actually become a candidate. How did you decide that? So another interesting story. So Ray LaRue and I uh, uh -huh. decided and to Ray run. And Ray LaRue ran, ran for governor in the Republican Party. He did. And so Ray and I worked together at Paycom back in the 2000 time right. frame, and literally our desk was six feet from each other. So we got to know each other, built a friendship, uh, worked together for about two years. And just past Christmas time, we had decided, hey, it's been too long. We need to get back together. Uh, let's grab lunch. And so over lunch, when we were talking about what's next for both of us, we both expressed the interest in moving in the government. And it was there at Murphy's Bar and Grill that we decided, you know what? Let's do the uh, governor, lieutenant governor uh, team. We can bring combined 50 years of military leadership 10 years of business leadership, his 10 years of state uh, state and Department of Education leadership, we can bring that together as a package into Hawaii politics, and we thought that was a winning winning combination. But still, somebody else could do that. Or you could, have, you could have backed <laughs> Ray, but, but you decided that you yourself would right. actually run for office. And that must have been a quite... Quite a decision. Uh, did you talk to? Did you talk to your spouse? <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact, <laughs> because as you know, as soon as you make that decision, you enter into a fishbowl. And so here's a funny, a funny story. I was uh, I had a sore throat, and I went to one of the local urgent care or acute care clinics. And as I was checking in, and the lady was asking me what my name is, another guy who was checking in heard my name. He's like, "Hey, good luck on the uh, on the primary." I was like, "Wow, well, we're definitely in a fishbowl all of a sudden." You have to post all your financials up on the, uh, right. you know, for the campaign spending. And I understand all that, but it's, it feels pretty intrusive. But I understand it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But so you're right. You are out there in the public, and you've got to be on your game 100% of the time. Now, you had to form a campaign organization. Did you find that easy, getting volunteers, contributions, and creating uh, actually a little company to run the business of the campaign? I, that was actually challenging. And so people are willing to help to a point. And I think sometimes people doubt their own abilities to jump in and lead a particular piece. So I built out a uh, org chart that said, OK, I need this kind of person here, someone handling volunteers. And I need this kind of person here handling media. I need someone building policy statements and that sort of thing. I think people are hesitant to take on that large of a role. So you have to be flexible and say, OK, that person wants to do sign waving. That person wants to write a single policy and, and understand how to bring all that together. So at the end of the day, to be honest, it was me and my friend Luke Balaki who drove this home. And so we were talking this morning. I said, hey, we did pretty good. Two guys, four months of campaign time, and we lost by about 200 votes, uh, 0.6 or 7 percent. So well, congratulations. I'm pleased with uh, the effort. I wish we had had more time. I think that would have been better. But now you ran as a Republican in the state of Hawaii, and it's no secret. We referred to that earlier that we are pretty much have a single party system here. We have uh, only Democrats as congresspersons, uh, no Republican in the state Senate, yeah. five and maybe, yes, five representatives in the state house. The governor is a Democrat. Uh, what's it like to go door to door or to just run for office as a Republican in this state? You know, it's challenging, and I think that's one of my lessons learned here I was going to talk about a little bit later, but I think people treat political parties like they're sports teams, and they're like, that's my sports team, I'm going to, that's my party, I'm going to do whatever, you know, I'm going to be with them forever, and I really encourage people to uh, get out and listen to the candidates. The other, the real challenge is, it was supposed to be a three-way three race on the Republican lieutenant governor, but tongue-in-cheek, there was a fourth candidate, some, some person named Blank Vote pulled, uh, <laughs> pulled about 5,000-plus votes out of, you know, I got around 9,500, and about 5,500 were blank votes. That tells me people were confused, or we hadn't gotten our message out. Uh, there, there's something wrong where blank votes were that high, so. So even within the Republican primary balloting, you had 5,000 people who simply left the lieutenant governor's slot blank altogether. Exactly. And one would think that with so prominent a, a race, that they would not necessarily vote for you, but they'd vote for somebody. For somebody, right. Because if you're going to pull that ballot, you don't want to waste the, your opportunity to weigh in on the lieutenant governor. Right. And, that, and it was disappointing for me to see the blank vote count so high. Again, that, either, that means the three lieutenant governor candidates together on the Republican side, we didn't do our job to get our message out to people. And well, well, let's extrapolate that e even larger. Not only did you have low voter participation in your race, per se. Right. But overall, we have one of the lowest voter participations in the entire 
country. The lowest. Per, per, per capita. <laughs> How about That's that? right. Yeah. And uh, what did you encounter as you went door to door, as you talked to people in terms of their attitude toward voting? So to be honest, I did not get a chance to go door to door very much. Mm -hmm. we, we focused on the broader piece. Sure. We focused on social, uh, social media and mm -hmm. uh, the, the conferences. And but you talked to lots of people. We did talk to a lot of people. And uh, so you're asking what they felt about a Republican running in a Democratic or, state? Or just what your impressions were as you met, met people in the state which has the lowest voter participation. It, you know, that's, that's sad you, to me. What did you but, learn? Well, so one of, the, one of the things I learned was, again, people, they focus on one issue, and in fact, the, the one, I ran into one guy around the Oahu Vet Center after a neighborhood board meeting. I, was str I struck up a conversation with him, and eventually, as we developed a conversation a little bit, and he found out I was a Republican because I want truth in advertising, I tried to be upfront with who I am, he, uh, he found one issue that really has nothing to do with Hawaii. It's already solved at the national level, but that was his issue. And because I had a different view, he started yelling at me and telling me I wasn't fit for office and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, so that's really not a great. I think that's sort of the Facebook environment that has gotten us to the point where we don't really treat people with respect or respect other people's ideas or viewpoints. People are trying to force their own viewpoints on others, and you know, it's not always it's not the right thing to do. As a Republican, did you come across people who kind of imported their view of national Republican politics and uh, even at the administration level, their view of President Trump and, and brought that down to the local level and applied it to you? The only, the only time I actually saw that, and it wasn't really quite the way you framed it up, but when I was doing my Hawaii News Now interview, they did ask me what my thoughts were on President Trump and if I supported him or not, and, and I definitely supported him, and uh, we didn't have enough time to go into uh, detail by detail why that is or what his ideas are and how I interpret that. But, but again, I think people are they're getting confused with what Hawaii needs, because I, I feel Hawaii is in really desperate times, especially if you look at the financial side of it and what their sort of overall ideas are on the national level and also that political party sports team analogy where this is my team. We've got a couple of minutes before the break. I wanted to ask you, what were the issues that you felt were most important to bring to the public during your race? So for me, realizing that the lieutenant governor's job is to support the governor's agenda, that was my number one platform, if you will. But my, my three E's were my private personal interest items. Three E's stood for economy, education, and environment. And we need as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, Hawaii's number one industry is tourism, and it's a fragile industry. And so with Hurricane Lane just off the side, if that turns mm -hmm. to us and hits us all of a sudden, we're going to have significant impact to the government because of lost taxes. We're going to have significant income or impact to the people who are in that service industry because tourists aren't going to come, just like during Hurricane Aniki. Obviously, you believe government needs to look at some changes or do something different that it's doing now in order to boost our economy. What would you propose? Well, so if you look at all the state-to-state -state comparisons, mm -hmm. we are routinely really low on all the lists we want right. to be high on. So voter turnout, we're really low. Best place to start a business, really low. Highest taxes, we're really high on that one. Uh, most value for taxes paid, we're low on that one. And so we need to be business friendly. We need to diversify our economy and expand it. We need to make sure that people have good uh, paying jobs so that that does two things, gives people an opportunity to live and that would positively impact the homeless problem and give people a chance to actually make some money. And then the other piece is that it would uh, it would develop our tax base. Well, even that's better. a strong message. We're going to come back after a short break. Okay, great. My guest today is Steve Lipscomb, who ran recently for lieutenant governor <coughs> here in the state of Hawaii in the Republican primary. And I'm Kili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's uh, Hawaii Together. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. 
For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation, and we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. My guest today, Steve Lipscomb, has just experienced what it is to go from a private life to a public one, a very public one, as he ran for office. Uh, he didn't succeed in the 2018 uh, primary of the Republican Party, but got very, very close. More than that, however, he learned a lot in the process, not only about electioneering, campaigning, but also about the people of Hawaii. We've got him back here again. Steve, what's one of the biggest lessons that you learned in the campaign? Well, interestingly, as I was out talking to some people, I would invariably run across the, the person that would say, I don't get involved in politics, Steve. And at first, it, it sort of took me by surprise. But afterwards, I developed, developed my response, which is, you may not want to get involved in politics, but make no doubt about it, politics will be involved with you. Ask yourself a couple questions. Why are my taxes so high? Why, does, uh, why do goods cost so much here? Um, why is housing so expensive? Why, do, or why are the schools struggling? You can trace all that back to political decisions. It, sounded, it sounds like you had a two-step you had to do, not, <laughs> not merely to get them interested in Steve Lipscomb, but first, even interested in politics. Exactly. And so just to get, as you know, we've got the lowest voter turnout. We've got, if you look at the numbers for this last election, about roughly about just really rough numbers, 250,000 people voted on the Democrat side roughly about 50,000 for everybody else. Together, that's about 300,000. We've got about 750,000 voters, so that, that gives us, or registered voters, so that gives us a 40-ish percent uh, turnout, plus or minus. Well, you, you actually uh, did something quite remarkable. You got onto the map and you amassed a good number of votes in your, in your market, so to speak. If you had the money and the time, what would you have kept doing? So for us to reach out to the masses as quickly as we needed, we needed to leverage social media. And so we leveraged uh, social and robocalls, and I wanted to leverage email campaigns. But what I found out was, even though the Supreme Court has said bulk emails from a political candidate to the constituency is absolutely a First Amendment right, because that's, that isn't count, sure. does not count as spam, the companies that allow you to do that, like GoDaddy, Constant Contact, MailChimp, they will not allow you to buy a list of people that haven't already opted in to receive emails from you, even if you're a politician. So the Supreme Court says, yes, you can bulk email, and the companies that provide that functionality say, no, you cannot. And I think that's a real challenge and something that needs to be looked at so as well. So you had some challenges. We did. You know, and your, your emails might e even be marked as spam going into various browsers. Right. So two things that would happen then is either I get shut down on my email piece mm -hmm. or the negative impact for those companies to have so much spam uh, is more than they would tolerate. So, so it was Were there activities you engaged in that ultimately proved not to be very valuable? Well, it's, it's hard to measure the value of sign sure. waving, so that's, uh -huh. there's, there's no uh, idea of what return on investment is on that one. But I will say really quickly— it, It's a rite of passage. In a right, <laughs> I see that. We people in Hawaii want to see our candidates go through it. Exactly, exactly. So and it's, it can be fun, uh, but— Especially in the rain. Right, and the burning sun. <laughs> so, But interestingly, so I'll, I'll give a shout-out to Waimea Community Association. So sure. a lot of the forums that I went to were very structured. You had all your candidates up on stage, Republicans and Democrats, and— Oftentimes, there was only two occasions, actually, where everybody was invited. Oftentimes, there was a subset of people that were invited. And so one person gets asked the question, next person, same question, same question. It's, it's not really boring. Or it's, it's boring. And so the guy at the end has listened to everybody's answer and then can shape his answer. What, what WCA, Waimea Community Association, did is they called it speed dating. And in the cafeteria, they had people set up at the different tables with an open space. You went around. Shotgun start. All the candidates went out to the tables. And then we changed tables about every nine or 10 minutes. So it gave us a chance to sit down, eyeball to eyeball with people, and really hear their issues and, and experience their issues versus sort of a, a moderator running through a question that doesn't have that same impact. So. Well, in a campaign, you've got to have that mix of personal interaction with people and mass media, social media impact. Right. How did you find the media as 
were they helpful in getting your message out, or did you find challenges there? So there were, there were a few challenges. Uh, some of the challenges were with individual organizations that would only have forums for a particular partisan side. So usually it was, if there was a forum, only Democrats were invited to it. And that was disappointing for me, and I think that's bad for democracy as well, as we're trying to give people a cross-section of what's available and what people's thoughts are. On the media side, as an example, I guess I can call out their actual names here, but uh, when the Repo Republican governor debate came up for Hawaii News Now, my running mate Ray LaRue wasn't invited. And even though the party and Ray engaged to try to get a seat on that stage, it wasn't allowed for some reason. I think that's unfortunate. Uh, for me in particular, I had a couple instances with Civil Beat where I was left out of the list of Republican lieutenant governor candidates. Uh, Steve Lipscomb was left off the name in an article in June. And then in July, they actually did a poll. They did a, a, a poll of several uh, hundred people, and my name wasn't one of the response options. So that gave my competitors sort of an unfair advantage. And when we went to Civil Beat to try to say, hey, this, this happened, what are we going to do about it? Uh, at first, they just said it was an oversight, and then eventually they said, you're not a front runner. And so when I tried to show that they were covering other races in their entirety and not just picking a couple front runners, but they weren't treating the Republican lieutenant governors that same way, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get any answers from that email. So that, I think that speaks to the difficulty uh, of anyone who's a newcomer without large name recognition being able to get on the map, but right. regardless of their qualification, right. regardless of their education. You, you've been in management positions. You have been uh, a leader. You have served the country. You've got two master's degrees. You've worked in corporate America. And yet, being able to position yourself has been a great challenge. It's well, definitely hard. Especially in a state with one party system. Right. As you think about it, what are some of the solutions? What are some of the ways you think you could break through should you run for office again? Well, I, th I think we the people need to demand that when we see a Democrat-only forum going on, that people rise up and say, hey, that's, that's not right. We want to hear from the whole cross-section. So that happened several times uh, across the islands. Um, there was a couple, by the way, the, I'll give a shout out to Hawaii Kai Neighborhood Board. They invited everybody. So that was the first time I got to meet some Green Party representatives. And I think that's, that's the job. I think, you know, with uh, President Trump's calling out about the media being the enemy of the public, uh, that's probably pretty strong. But the media, I grew up understanding the media to be a watchdog agency. Hey, you guys are out there to make sure that things are kind of running right. And so when they only cover a certain party, I think they're neglecting that idea that their job is to inform the public not to form the public. So they're not trying to, they shouldn't be trying to form and shape opinions. I think they should be reporting to inform. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, I would ask you uh, what you think of the condition of your party and what, what are the challenges that your party may face? Well, that's a fair question for sure. I think there's no secret that the Republican Party has atrophied over the years here in Hawaii. Uh, I think I'm really encouraged. And in fact, I was one of the reasons I stepped up was I saw strong leadership in the Republican Party right now with Shirley Nostrov. So she's a retired Air Force 06 colonel. Uh, she's leading the charge there. And she's got Aaron Wilson uh, as her executive director and a staff of people that are willing to jump in there and help. Uh, the other encouraging thing is the training team at the Republican Party gave us a 10-week training course on candidacy and covered everything from marketing to fundraising to, I mean, just across the board. So that was, that was really encouraging to see the dedication of people giving up their time and not just the time on the Saturday, but the prep time to bring all that together. That was really encouraging. So what I had sent, uh, said over to Charlene is I'm, I'm willing to be part of that effort now that I don't have to focus on running for office any longer. I'm happy to get in there and start building the Republican Party from the grassroots level. And again, the, the main thing here is we have to have, we talk about diversity all the time. You have to have diversity of thought inside of your government or else you've just got a monopoly. Yeah. Now, we've already talked about the fact that you were a first timer when it came to politics and didn't have that name recognition. But you have another challenge, and that is you're a Republican in a one party state. Right. How do you conceive of overcoming that challenge for the Republican Party in the years to come? Um, especially since there's been such a, a downward trend in terms of office holding by Republicans. 
So I, th I think it's a multifaceted approach. I think one is having the strong leadership to take the party uh, out of the ashes, if you will, and, and make it a viable uh, entity. I think the other part is having people step up to be candidates and letting people see that there are great candidates. We have a lot of great candidates in this race, uh, in this, this election cycle in the, of the various races. I'd like to see that expanded because there's still a lot of uncontested seats out there that I think we can go after. But, uh, but I think that's the key is um, making sure strong leadership, making sure that we have great candidates. And then the last piece is targeting that white space. So we talked about the 250,000 Democrat voters and around 50,000 other non-Democrat voters. But there's still a, a system of about 700 plus thousand people in there that aren't voting and they're just out there. We need to get them energized and again, making sure that they understand politics is involved in your life. You, if you don't want to owe the responsibility to the state or to your friends, you owe it to yourself to make sure that you're getting involved in politics and making sure that the people that you put in office are working in your best interest. Did you gain any sense while you're campaigning of any issue that really touched the hearts of people, something that they might rally around? Well, that's an interesting question. I, uh, with me, with my three E's, and, and uh, Ray LaRue's was pretty similar. He had infrastructure in there. In fact, when we did our um, nomination, well, our announcement, we did it in front of the Waikiki, what's it called, the natatorium, the War right. Memorial. And we wanted to use that as a symbol of sort of the crumbling infrastructure across the state. And I, th I think those are some of the issues that people, hot, hot button topics is, hey, I, d I don't have enough money to make ends meet. I've got to work two or three jobs. So high cost of living, high taxes, again, uh, low paying jobs. We have some of the lowest unemployment in the country, but we have people working two or three jobs right. in order to make it all work. Last year we had 13,000 people leave Hawaii net because they can't make it happen anymore. And so if you extrapolate that out into the future, where, where does that end? You've got, you know that that's not the low income people who can't afford to leave and it's not the rich people that can afford to stay. It's the folks in the middle that sort of make the economy run that are leaving. So if you extrapolate out to the future a little bit, where does that that's right. take us? Everybody's and, concerned about whether exactly. we can live in paradise any longer. Right, exactly. Well, thank you, Steve, so much for being on the program All today. My pleasure. I've enjoyed your insights, and I want to wish you the best in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. My guest today, Steve Lipscomb, ran for office, learned quite a bit in the process, and has become an even more committed citizen here of the state of Hawaii and the United States. And my hat goes off to him and everyone else who has been participating in the political process. Uh, it's easy to say things are bad and they, they won't change, but as the saying goes, no, gr no vote, no, gr no grumble, no yeah, vote. No vote, no grumble, that's <laughs> no right. No vote, no grumble, exactly. there you go. Yep. Steve's got that down <laughs> better than I do. See you next time. I'm Kili Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Aloha.